Good evening. It's a pleasure to introduce my colleague to you, Ms. Minty Jain. I believe the hosts are giving you our profile, so we can skip that formality here. And with me is Professor Vijay Padaki, who is better known as simply Vijay. And now we're ready to begin. Salam, Ruby. We're gathered today to celebrate the 160th birth anniversary of Rabindranath Tagore, Rabindranath Thakur, Roby Doll, Roby. Welcome. That's it. An introduction to the evening's performance needs to have something more, don't you think? All that needs to be said is there in the performance itself. We can get on with the show, don't you think? There are a couple of important announcements to be made. You mean about switching off mobile phones or keeping them on silent mode? That shouldn't be necessary, I believe. All right, uh, let me do it then. Three reputed institutions have got together to offer events through the year for Rovida's 160th anniversary year. You will have read already that they are BIC, Bangalore International Centre, Manthan, the Centre for Public Discourse in Hyderabad, and Bangalore Little Theatre, known better as BLT. Now we can begin, right? Today, we revisit the work of Robi Da for and with children. Ah, but all of it loved universally by grown-ups as well. What we're presenting today is an abridged version of a full-length play titled Roby's Garden. The play has a large set of colourful characters. Ah, uh, but we're just two actors here. So, we're giving you a storytelling theatre version of the full play now. This version of Roby's Garden was put together specially for Manta and presented at their annual Samwad in October last year. It seemed most appropriate to kick off the joint celebration on Romy Dahl's birthday with this play. In the play, a small group of children is on an excursion to Jora Shanko, where Tagore's ancestral home is located in Kolkata. They enter the Kotia Theatre in Thakurbari and sense a magical air surrounding them. And that should do for an introduction. Let's watch the play. One more thing. Many of you would know that the great Bengali poet, writer and critic Shankar Ghosh passed away recently. He was the first person to comment on the full play script of Roby's Garden when it was put together in 2011, the year of Roby Da's 150th birth anniversary. He saw it as a first draft. He loved the play and described the script as beautifully constructed and truly lyrical, doing full justice to Gurudev. We would like to dedicate the performance this evening to the memory of Shankar Ghosh. The performance is just an hour long. Most live performances have a discussion at the end, with the people sharing their reactions readily. Comments and questions are usually about rediscovering Tagore. Feel free to send your comments online at this show. You may also send them to either of us directly. Let's the play begin. Salam, Roby. We're here to celebrate the work of Rabindranath Tagore, Rabindranath Thakur, Roby Dam, Roby. We revisit his work for and with children, but all loved universally by grown-ups as well. What we're presenting today is an abridged version of the full-length play titled Roby's Garden. 
The play has a large set of colourful characters. But we are only two actors here. So we present them a storytelling theatre rendition of the play. We dip into the large treasure chest of Robida's stories, but we have to be satisfied with just a handful of the gems there today. These include verse, short stories, plays and sketches, his riddle plays, fantasies, autobiographical writings, especially his childhood memories and letters to his granddaughter and other children. In the play, a group of children is on a visit to Jorashako where Robi Da's ancestral home is located in Kolkata. They enter the courtyard theater and sense a magical air surrounding them. The Chaukidar caretaker of the estate, who looks suspiciously like Kabuliwala, shares an important mantra of Robida with the children. But the first step in getting what you want in life is imagination. It's the surest way of bringing Robida's stories alive on the courtyard stage. Just then we see Robida's armchair, raised high and lit from above. We hear his voice. I made up games of my own. Sometimes I was a teacher. The railings on the balcony were the pupils in my class. There were always a few pupils who didn't care about their lessons. I had to be stern with them. I warned them that if they didn't study hard, they would end up as schoolies. Ah yes, they are to be punished too. A teacher had a cane in the classroom in those days. When people look at Robida's picture, they can only see him as Gurudev. He looks so serious in all those pictures, like a philosopher or a high priest or prophet Moses or something like that. They can't see another side to him. The fun-loving side. Oh. Robida was a philosopher already. Everybody knows that. But he was a philosopher with a twinkle in his eye. And you know what? He could be very philosophical while poking fun at things. What did he poke fun at? Oh, many things. The short-sighted caste system, the arrogance of the rich and the famous, the chamcha giri of those who went along with them. Western orientation of the elite, self-appointed godmen and their gullible chelas, doctors and their fees and their mysterious medicines. All of these seen as much today as in his time. He came from a wealthy family himself, but spent a lot of time with the poor, working on the family's lands. Maybe that is why he could laugh at people like his own. Maybe that is why he saw wisdom in the lives of humble people all the time. Robida was deeply spiritual in his personal life, but constantly critical of blind faith and superstition. He had very little patience with religious bigotry. For instance, in a little sketch titled The Aryans, we see the publisher of a progressive magazine visited by a man whose claim to fame is that he is an Aryan. You are? I'm an Aryan. That means a Hindu. No, I'm an Aryan first, a Hindu by the way. Your name? Chintamani Kundan Chatur Das. And what can I do for you? I wish to write an essay for your magazine. Do you have a topic for the essay? I shall write on the supremacy of the Aryan religion. You will pardon my ignorance, but what is this Aryan business? You don't know about Aryan heritage. Look, sir, I am an Aryan. My father, Sri Nakul Kundan Chatur Das, is an Aryan. His father, Sri Sahadev Kundan Chatur Das, is an Aryan. A Chaturful family, I see. So, by religion, are you different from the rest of us? I suppose so. How do you tell the difference between Aryan religion and 
non aryan religion that which is not non aryan religion is aryan religion and who would be the non aryans those are not aryans are non aryans for instance i am not a non aryan my father sri nakul kundan chaturbhuj das is not a non aryan his father sri sahadev kundan chaturbhuj das is not a non aryan and his father i think i've got it By now a group has gathered in the publisher's office they are in awe of the aryan one in the group says scientific facts came to us after all from europe which is the land of the aryan uh, european aryans are an inferior race the best science came from indian aryans don't you know that that means hindu aryans aryans first hindu by the way Indian Aryan science is far ahead of European science. For instance, take your hair oil. You will have noticed that in every Aryan household, even today, they put three drops of oil on the floor before applying a palmful on the head. Do you know why? Perhaps you'll be good enough to educate us on the matter. How can you write scientific articles when you don't know something elementary as this? Do you know why Aryans snap their fingers while yawning? I know. Snap fingers while yawning? There must be an explanation. We must find out. Look at yourselves. You proclaim that uh, European Aryans gave us science, and yet you know nothing about why Aryans sneeze or yawn or massage their head with oil. Sir, about dropping oil on the floor before applying it on the head. How fascinating observation! What is the explanation? It is called magnetism. In English, they call copied it and called it magnetism. That means you have studied the concept of magnetism in English texts. Entirely unnecessary. You don't need English to study science. You don't need English to study anything. True, true. English only confuses things, especially the pronunciation. Don't you know what Indian Aryan science says? There are three kinds of energy: within energy, without energy, and out within energy. When the body is oiled, an out within energy is created in the soul within, leading to a magnetic field without. that is magnetism at work for you to counter this magnetic field the englishman invented the turkish towel to be rubbed on the head vigorously after a shower indian aryans have had a thousand year old legacy of using a hand woven gumcha sure a superior practice to the english habit And all you can do is to keep parroting that Englishman Newton's utterances, which he picked up from Indian Aryan science in the first place. Wow! The origin of magnetism, purpose of magnetism, discovery of magnetism, invention of magnetism. I could go on. Please do, please go on. Aryan physics, Aryan chemistry, and snapping finger while yawning. Reverse magnetism. The concavity of the palm charges converging power, setting off a parallel generating process in which receptive force breaking free of impelling force is correspondingly acted upon by compelling force, transcending life, cause, and retention. Then Satwa, Rajas, and Tamas converge into an escape mechanism, punctuated by the snapping of middle finger and thumb. releasing neurological heat preventing solar heat from entering the orifices of the human body and disturbing the essential body heat equilibrium if this is not science what is by now the group that's gathered is sufficiently mesmerized they garland him offer him a saffron robe they kneel before him and make him a god man mankind's craving for mumbo jumbo must be satisfied
The story of the gentleman jackal digs at Bengalis of that time whose idea of success in life was to ape Englishmen. An institution is set up to create gentlemen jackals. It is called the Association for the Cultural Development of Canines Jackal Chapter. ACDCJC for short. The action area is the veranda of a bungalow, very English veranda in a very English home. We see a woman, very English, seated in her chair, reading her English newspaper with her morning cuppa. A jackal appears. He steps in unnoticed, walks up to the woman and peers over her shoulder. The jackal taps the woman on the shoulder. She lets him look at the newspaper. A man appears. Very English, and he takes in the scene. The jackal moves to pour him a cup of tea. It's working. We've got Hua to take an interest in the newspaper. That's his name. Hua. He can't read it, of course. Getting a jackal to make conversation with us was not too difficult, but getting him to read a newspaper. An English newspaper. Oh, too much for who are at this stage. That's his name. Who? Well. Oh, there's so much more we can do with who are. Yes, yes, yes. We are ready for the morning test. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. What is your name? Huva. Good. We can now begin the day's work. Uh, uh, begging your pardon, ma'am. Sir, you're very kind and generous in taking me as your student. But you're only teaching me doggy tricks. Sitting, begging, dropping. Any stupid Labrador can do these tricks. Surely a jackal deserves something more. Uh, what would you have us do with you? Can't you make a man out of me? You mean like a... Uh, a gentleman, so that I can also sit in the baramda and have chai and biscuit and wear a suit and a tie, go to the cinema. Uh, why on earth would you want to do all that? Well, all in the jackal tribe hold you humans in such great awe. You are like gods to them. If I can also look like a human, then I'll be a... B.I.P. Jekyll, B.B.I.P. Jekyll, even a Godman Jekyll. Shri Huwa Nanda Shankara. Shri 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 Huwa Nanda Shankara. What do you say? Shall we take him on? I think he's ready for it. I say let's give it a go. The man and the woman now wear surgeon's gowns and don surgeon's masks. There's a series of surgical procedures on hua, all quite wacky, with hacksaw blades and hammers and chisels and garden scissors. And the very first job is to straighten hua's hind legs and make him stand on his two legs. <clears throat> Next, we must strip him of his fur and cover him up with a shirt and bow tie and a solar topi. Oh, but the tail. So off with the tail. <whistles> the bare rear end is covered with a black tail coat. At last, who I stood before a mirror to look at himself. He's pleased. Ah, oh, but we can't call him Hua anymore. As a human animal, in human clothes and a human bearing, he must have a human name. Um, henceforth, he shall be called Jack. The work done. The surgeons prepare to depart. Uh, uh, sir, is there any follow-up treatment? Any diet restriction? Oh, yes, of course. And this is very important. 
for the next 30 days and 30 nights, you must not, repeat simply must not, speak to anybody from the jackal tribe. You must not meet any of them, you must not speak to any of them, you must never again speak to your native jackal, jackal language. You must keep telling yourself who you are. And that is... Who are... No! You are... Jack! Good. You must meditate for two hours every day telling yourself that you are Jack. How should I do that? Oh, try chanting. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Meanwhile, who was aunt? The one who had given him his name was worried. She was also the buck buck of the tribe. In fact, she was called Chatter D. Oh, how she loved Hua, who had left the village days ago and hadn't been seen ever since. Anxious about his disappearance, she went to the village chief and demanded that he set up a search party to look for Hua. He was no ordinary jackal after all. He had the fine, finest furry tail in the whole kingdom. Meanwhile, Hua, fully recovered and cheerful, was thinking about how he could astonish the family and the tribe and how they would make him their god. A search party of jackals is seen approaching the action area, crouched, catching the scent, advancing, No scent of who are here. Some other strange scent coming this way. It smells like the puss puss the humans spray under their armpits. The search party decides to try calling Hua. Hua. There's a booming voice heard over the stage. Jack, remember what you've been told? Ignore them. The search party decides to try again. Hold your ground, Jack. They will go away. The search party decides to try harder. cannot take it any longer. The search party enters the clearance the same moment Hua does. There is shocked silence, broken by the excited proclamations of Hua in his newly acquired accent. Hello, how are you doing? I am Jack. The search party remains stunned. Auntie, it's me. Oh, the search party shrieks and runs away in all directions. A ghost, a mad ghost, a ghost freak, an English ghost. Who is left standing there, finely dressed, speechless. All he can do is moan. You will ask, what did Hua do after that? What could he do? He was here, neither here nor there, shooed away by the humans, snapped at and snarled at by the jackals. He tried meditating to a different rhyme to get his tail back. Any tail would do. A rabbit's tail, a mongoose, even one of little Bo Beep's lambs. But nothing worked. You'll say, poor Hua? Not really. He was last seen wandering over the hills, giving lectures at ashrams and conferences. We hear that the management institutes are also after him now. In the next little story, we catch a glimpse of Robidar's writing in verse, entirely in fun. Robida loved to joke about death.
Oh, he wrote about flowers and trees and birds and flight and sunrises and sunsets. But he could be really funny when he wrote about death. Here's a poem rather typical of his style. An elderly gentleman is fast asleep and doesn't wish to be disturbed. His servant wishes to wake him up uh, because the house is on fire. The gentleman could not go. He does not wish to be disturbed. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Uh, your faithful servant, sir. If you care to listen for just one moment, uh, it's not good news I bring. Uh, just one ear, please, your pillow, you may still cling. Go away. I will arise when I hear the alarm ring. When I'm on my feet, you may bring news, good or bad. New uh, or still, or about floods or earthquakes or ministers in jail. Sir, the house is on fire. No answer came. Did he not hear? Was he playing a game? Um, you must be up, sir, and about no time to lose without a doubt. Opening half an eye, the old man said, You know what happens to my head when my sleep is incomplete? The blasted migraine leaves me dead beat. Sir, your migraine, all things said, is better than waking up dead. Uh, not just cold in hands and feet, but roasted, toasted, charred meat. Ah, stop pestering me, I will awake. When it's time to take toothbrush to teeth, towel to face, early rising was such a disgrace. The old man neither stirred nor turned while the ground floor burned. When the flames lit the windows on the left, he turned right, avoiding the sight. Uh, the servant tried once more to plead with the master to heed the urgent call of crumbling walls and blazing bed. Go away, you! Always and forever obedient, the servant fled. Robidon though, loved to poke fun at doctors and medicine men. In a little story titled, The Last Rites, the story opens with the family patriarch on his deathbed. The sons are busy with the funeral preparations. The invitation list has only all the prominent Englishmen of Calcutta. And oh, they must look into the advance booking at the crematorium, the police bandobast at the funeral procession, the tea and the snacks at the reception after that, and so on. The sons asked the doctor for the estimated time of his departure to end, the doctor says. Oh. Hardly any time left. They must rush. The doctor pleads with the son to stop at the pharmacy and pick up the needed medicines. That can wait. The funeral preparations are more important. The next scene is the next morning. The sons are gathered around the old man's bed, very glum. The old man is sitting up, quite cheerful, a packet of potato chips in his hand. He recovers as he does not get the prescribed medicine. The sons attack the doctor for the poor estimate of his departure time. What kind of a doctor are you? You said 2 a.m. It's almost noon now. Tcha! Why could he not have gone at the appointed hour? We can't be punctual at anything we do. Look at the Englishman. Here's a little poem the children in the play wrote 
just for this story. It's about doctors, of course. There was a doctor of Chittagong with a list of patients two miles long. On closer look, I read that all of them were dead. There was a doctor of Kuch Bihar with secret remedies in a jar. A spoonful here, a spoonful there, corpses littered everywhere. There was a doctor of Bangalore, rather proud of his hit and run score. Patients of every description dispatched with a single prescription. The next little sketch is set in a train compartment, two men meeting in a train compartment. We can do the whole sketch right here. We called it in the pink of death. Hmm. It's getting worse by the minute. It's getting unbearable. Which part of the head is hurting? The right side. Excuse me, you are? Uh, just asking, just asking. You seem to be in great distress. An understatement, sir. The pain is killing me. Hmm. Uh, right side, you say? Is it throbbing? Dhug, 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 dhug. You can see how miserable I am, can't you? Miserable, yes. Just what my brother had. Your brother. My brother. He has headaches like this. Had. Had. He got rid of them. You could say that. He died. He. He's dead. He, he died. Did he have. Uh, just like yours? In the last two days of his life, he even looked just like you now. Looked like me. Sick. Really sick. Uh. But my, my headache is just... Uh, Throbbing, the pain going down the whole side, cramping the leg. How does the right leg feel? Ah, cramped, I can see. Your eyes, tired, yes. Partly open lips, skin colour turned pale. Looseness of arm joints. I, I have all of these. Why, why didn't anybody tell me? My, my family, my friends. Everybody's so busy in their own lives these days. Who has the time to look at others closely? My doctor. Anyway? He Doc should have told me. You believe in doctors? Yeah, of course. Utterly impossible people. Everything ulta pulta in their work. When you have no problem at all, he'll give you 20 medications and a dozen tests. And when you're seriously ill, he has no time for you. Even on your deathbed. Uh, please, bed, please. The time You're scaring the me. doctor will attend to you only after your body has turned cold to give, give your family a death certificate and then to collect fees for oh that. My, oh my, I'm feeling really sick now. Uh, uh, do you think my hands are turning cold? Hmm. Uh, let me ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. At night, do you sleep on your back or on your side? On my back, all the time. Why? Just like my brother. Uh, he could not turn at all when he was lying on his back. But I can turn, I can turn either side. But you may not be able to in another two weeks. Really? First, there will be pain there on the right side of the rib cage, and then it will spread downwards quickly. Within six days, all the five toes will cry out in pain, and then the swelling in the joints, and then the arms, and then the palpitations. Uh, stop, stop. Uh, I'm feeling giddy. You are palpitating. Uh, I'm not feeling good at all. You're not looking good at all. You need serious attention. I know, but what should I do? Are you by any chance on allopathic medicine? Yes, of course. Cut them. Allopaths are psychopaths. Their prescriptions are nothing but poisons. More dangerous than the disease. You should be more scared of the allopath than the disease. Should I change to... Homeopathy? Homeopaths are sociopaths. Their medications are nothing but chalk powder and tap water. The same tap water sold by different foreign sounding names. I, I, I think I will try Ayurveda. If your body cannot take a throbbing dhag dhag headache, how will it take Ayurveda? 
safer to take bhang and dhatura from a copper vessel. Oh my, <laughs> oh my terrible fate, what am I to do now? You hmm. tell me sir, what should I do? Hmm. You'll show me the way out, won't you? There seems to be no way out. But there must be. Just like my brother's case. You're the one who gave me the scare. You must show me the way out. Hey, what is there to be scared of? Our passage in this world is brief, even though life itself is eternal. We come into this world, we stay for a while and then we leave. We all have to go someday. We cannot, we, we have to leave someday. We cannot take anything with us. It will all be over soon. <sighs> I must remain cheerful. Look at the bright side of things. Even my doctor, my doctor told me that. Do you think he knew? Uh, maybe he's a doctor after all, an allopath. I want to get off this train. Train is moving. Moving. Uh, I'll get off at the next station. I'll get off at Madhopur. Train will not stop at Madhopur. Why won't it stop at Madhopur? There's an outbreak of cholera there. No train will stop there for another week. I'm scared. I'm scared. Are what are you scared of? I'm scared. I'm dying. According to scientists studying the subject of fear, those who are scared of dying have a greater probability of dying first. Call the guard. The guard got off at the last station. A new one will get on at the next station. Oh, oh, oh my heart, oh my head. Oh, please call a doctor. There must be a doctor on the train. Does it feel serious? Yes, yes, very serious. Please call a doctor quick. I didn't never trust a doctor when you're most in need. <laughs> I think I'm dying. Hmm. How is the pain throbbing, going down the whole side, cramping the leg? How does the right leg feel? Ah, cramped, I can see. Your eyes, <gasps> tired, yes. Partly open lips, skin color turned pale. Looseness of arm joints. Just like my brother. Tagore's Tiger Tales. What was it about the tiger that fascinated Robida? Did its ruthless power remind him of human upper caste arrogance? Or was it the beast's simple mindedness and innocence under the rough and tough exterior? The tiger found its way into a lot of Tagore's writing in both verse and prose. Here's a little poem he wrote for his granddaughter, in which he takes a little dig at the Indian caste system. Imagine a group of four children animatedly reciting the poem on stage. Much more charming than the two of us attempting it here today. A black striped tiger wandering into a mansion saw a servant preening himself before the mirror. Ah, uh, dinner is served, he thought to himself, and moaned a half growl, half in jest. The servant first shivered, then froze, the image of the beast in the glass growing at every step. Next moment he had fled the room, wings sprouting in a flash on his heels. When the beast leapt to the spot vacated, he saw... An image unexpected. Oh, the face was the same handsome beast, but the body, horrors, had stripes of black. He stormed out of the house, all thought of dinner abandoned. To the river bank he went to scrub himself clear, rub and scrub and rub some more. The stripes looked darker than before. On the opposite bank was our little baby, filling pots of water in her evening chore. In a flash, he placed himself before her, knocking a pot or two, spilling furor. How dare you, she cried. Those pots were full. Do you know whose house they come from and go to? Do you know who you're talking to, girl? Asked a bundle of stripes and puffed whiskers. Will you go on? Or do you wish to hear the crack of brass pot on hollow head? 
Mr. Stripes all thinks said knew his priorities. Teaching Davy a lesson could wait. His need now is a bar of detergent soap. Seen as the last hope of redemption from the curse of brush strokes on his body. This impudence had to be tolerated. Will you hand it over or will you make me do things you'll regret or not live to tell? Detergent soap? What was that? Davy confessed she could not afford it, had never used it. Lies, cried the tiger. There she was. A spotless stretch of white across a dark body. How could she not have the much needed bar? Out with the soap or in you go as dinner. Least ruffled, Davy cried. Shameless beast, will you even in des desperation of mind and body stoop to make a meal of one so low of birth? You are doomed if you touch me, doubly so if you taste the flesh on me. Your body defiled, you will be cast out of the family. Heads of ancestors hung in shame. Speechless, unbelieving, the beast retreated. Has Devi, finding new courage, advanced upon him? Uh, stay there, not a step nearer. His growls turned to howls as he bounded back where he came from. In the next Tiger Tale, we see a tiger ashram set deep inside a forest. The chief pundit is with a group of young apprentice pundits learning the scriptures of tiger morality. There's a flip chart board set up for the session. The chief pundit opens the first chart, Thou shall not steal. Repeat after me. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. What does it mean? I'm asking you, what does it mean when the good book says, Thou shalt not steal? It means that thou are not allowed to steal, but we are allowed. <laughs> That is the way the stupid two-legged human creatures live their lives, not tigers. We are of superior stock. We never steal. We never steal. Neither do we covet the belongings of others. Every tiger hunts his own food and hunts enough for the whole family. No tiger steals another's food. And no tiger hunts more than what is actually needed. I have seen an obese tiger. Uh, Panditji, are there any rules about what a tiger must not eat? Like onion, garlic? A tiger must not eat anything vegetarian. No artificial flesh or blood. No tomato ketchup? Absolutely forbidden. Towards the end of the story, there's a short exchange between Tagore and his granddaughter. She is called Pupli in the play. We see Tagore's armchair lit upstage. And we hear Rovida's voice speaking to Pupli. And she asks him, Tigers are quite orthodox in their customs, are they not? Of course. And they abide by them strictly. Now, you know, as much as the tiger detests the hyena, its meat untouchable, unthinkable, the hyena, on the other hand, holds the tiger in the highest esteem. If a hyena comes across a tiger's half-eaten meal, oh, it is prasad from the highest temple. But if tigers are so orthodox, then why do they commit the sin of killing in the first place? Oh, but the killing is sanctified. Oh, there is a mantra for before every killing, sometimes after the kill. Is the mantra chanted? It's a deep growl, followed by a snarl. And what if the tiger forgets to growl the mantra? Oh, misery. 
The tiger will then be born in the next birth in the form of the animal killed. Oh, Ma, then the tiger can be reborn as a human too? No, the one fate they dread the most. That is why a tiger is very particular about growling before killing a human. In the anxiety, sometimes it becomes a mighty roar. What is so dreadful about being reborn as a human? What could be worse? The human animal is hairless, no tail. How do they whisk flies off their backs? Oh, they need wives to do that for them. How ridiculous they look, standing on their hind legs all the time, their undersides covered with clothing. The tiger scriptures have an explanation for all this madness. It says that Lord Vishwakarma had finished creating the universe and was about to take a, a much needed break. Just then, a little dog walked up to him and asked for a companion animal. By then, all the raw material needed for creation had been used up, but, uh, but not wanting to disappoint the little dog, looking up and smiling and, and wagging his tail, Lord Vishwakarma decided to make do with whatever was left. So, so the human animal was created anyway. It turned out to be an odd creature, defective in many ways. A mistake, you could say. What do we do? The earth is now stuck with them. One of Tagore's funniest poems is about the origin of shoes. In the play, the children engage the audience with a question or two. Do you collect stamps? Some people collect stamps, some people collect coins. What do you collect? And you? And you there? Does anybody collect socks? No? No? <laughs> yes! Does anyone collect shoes? Why not? This may be of interest to you. It is said that Imelda Marcos, the wife of the President of Philippines, had a large collection of shoes. How many shoes? Actually, nobody knows the exact number because the shoes were kept in different places, under the bed, on top of the fridge, in the garage, in the bathroom, as lampshades over her beds, as pots for her chrysanthemums, as salt and pepper shakers, soup ladles, ashtrays, hidden in the crockery cupboard, in the cutlery drawer, rolled inside carpets, sewn onto hats, pinned onto gowns, dangled from ceiling fans, tied to doorknobs, fitted to the twelve legs of the banquet table, and not to forget, the garland of shoes on the front door on Christmas Day. Actually, nobody knew the exact number of shoes owned. Until one day, they found in the palace a shoe rack the length of a badminton court with three followed by three zeros, 3,000 pairs of shoes, plus or minus. More likely plus, they thought. That makes us wonder what kind of shoes are worn in Uzbekistan? In Turkmenistan. In Kyrgyzstan, which we don't even know how to spell. That leads us to the question, where were the first shoes made? Who invented them? And the Chokidar Kabuliwala steps in and says, ah, That is well known. It was an right here in Butpalistan, in the reign of K good King Hoblu. You want to know more? Huh? We will show you! King Hoblu is seated on his throne, glum, frustrated with the dust on his feet. His chumcha ministers are perplexed. The chief minister is called Goblu. The story begins with an exchange between Hoblu and Goblu. 
dust. Ah, dust, dhool on his majesty's feet. They all scramble to take the dust from his feet Chief, for their foreheads. Chief Minister Goblu. Your majesty. I've pondered over it for many sleepless nights. It is something in the air, your majesty. It is on my feet, Goblu. There's dust on my feet. Ah, huh, your feet, your majesty. Uh, dust, your majesty. Your majestic feet, your majesty. Uh, I have noticed that my feet, whenever they touch the street, get covered on the underside with dust from the street side. Uh, dust, street, underside, underside. <laughs> Look at the brow of your king. You see, he is frowning. What was he keeping a council of ministers for? The king asked. So, am I not paying you enough? Check. Are you happy with what you get? Double check. Am I happy with what I get in return? A question mark. Have you stopped dust getting to my feet? Exclamation mark. Ah, the dust, the dust. We must do something about it, must we not? Must we not? We must, we must. A hundred and twenty ministers in this land. Commissions, committees, working hand in hand, scientists, godmen, magicians, dressed in robes so neat, clueless about the dust on my feet. Take heed. It is Monday, the first day of the week. It is noon, the sun at its peak. Till noon of next Sunday, you must toil. Find an answer, or you boil in oil. The king storms out. The ministers have to now find a solution for the dust getting to his majesty's feet. When you have no answer yourself, what do you do? You appoint a task force. The experts come, the experts go. The recommendations are piled higher and higher. And higher, the recommendations of each expert more ridiculous than the previous one. The first to give his presentation is the economist. Dr. Motu Aluwala from the National Economic Commission with its headquarters up there in the clouds. After due consideration of all the data on hand, giving corrections to bandwidth particles in sand, other things being equal, assumptions x and y, root mean square of area, wet and dry, extrapolated trajectory, sine twice cosine, area minus volume into mass turbine. Uh, where is this heading? What's the bottom line? What do you have for these grimy feet of mine? Brooms, your majesty, brooms infusion. Exactly. 2,083,000 brooms will suffice to cleanse the entire kingdom in a trice. The entire cast appears on stage, brooms in hand, sweeping away, a big bass drum providing the beat. A boom da boom da boom boom, a boom da boom da boom boom, a boom da boom da boom boom, a swish swish. Swatch a bar at the swish, swish, boom, boom. They're all over the stage, raising dust. Every square inch of the kingdom is swept and scrubbed. Where did it all go, the kingdom's dust? Up in the air for a start, up in the air to sideways with the breeze, sideways to inside of every room of every dwelling. The king gets into a coughing and sneezing fit. He wants them to stop, stop. But they can't hear him. They've covered themselves up and they can't hear him. They're sweeping away. Stop! At last he picks up a broom and whacks a bottom or two. Ow, ow! <laughs> dust inside rooms, dust outside, dust risen miles high filling up the sky, blanking out the sun and moon and stars, dust all around, except on the ground. Blundering dunderheads, morons galore. These are worse than the engineers of Bangalore. A sire. A minor error, a miscalculation. The first expert slinks out and the next one walks in. A renowned technocrat, Sam Petromax from the Hardwire Corporation. 
Bum, 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 bum. Sire, you must now try our recommendation, sire. It had better be better than the last one. No time to lose, no time to regret. The engineers have already completed the task of sweeping the entire kingdom. Don't we know that? Thus, we know the exact area of land. With dust, we propose that we work on the principle of prevention being the best cure. That being? We prevent the dust from becoming dust. We do this by dousing the land with water and stamping the dust in. Stamping? Stamp. Thus, the dust is permanently restricted to remain where it belongs, not rising to soil the royal feet. The entire caste appears on the stage once again. Pouring water and stamping the earth in. A boom da boom da boom boom. A boom da boom da boom boom. A boom da boom da boom boom. A boom da boom da boom. They needed an army of a million to water the earth and an equal number to stamp the earth in after it had been warmed. Every able-bodied man and woman from every village was drafted into the mission. A royal proclamation guaranteed employment for the rural poor so that they could be on the project through the year. Volunteers by the millions poured into the recruitment offices. It was all to serve the good king, they said, happily. Where did they get so much water from? Oh. There were the ponds, the lakes, the rivers. Uh, there were wells in every village. And that was enough? Uh, just about. They were drained to the last drop. Every pond, lake and village, every well in every village. What happened to all the fish? They died, of course. But it was for a good cause. Um, all the wa water buffaloes died too. All the beasts around, the water bodies. Uh, the, the boat stopped sailing. With so much water poured into the city, it must have become a floating city. A uh, sinking city? Ten minutes of rain in Calcutta and you know what we have. A stinking city? Uh, my feet are now clear of mud, but they are caked with clay. After a few more rounds of expert advice, we now seem to have one who has the ultimate solution. A top-notch management consultant from a top-notch consultancy firm, McKinkey Corporation. The sire, sire, the problem of dust is the problem of its ascension, which is to say its non-attachment to the earth. Mm. The problem thus defined, we need to find a solution by which the dust is permanently attached to be clung to like Mother Earth. Oh. Um, proceed. We shall find the best cobbler in the kingdom and we shall assign him the task of covering the land with leather and sewing it tight. Not a speck of dust will be allowed to escape from beneath. The land shall be free of dust once and for all. Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, go and bring the best cobbler in the land. Uh, no delay, go at once. I have already found the man, sire. He is waiting for you. One from the group brings the cobbler in. He is poor, emaciated, sparsely dressed. He carries a work bag. He is led to the king. Kneel before his royal highness. <clears throat> the cobbler does so. His gaze is now fixed at the king's feet. The king's feet, they are dusty. Precisely that's why you've been called here. The cobbler pulls out a piece of cloth and is wiping the king's feet. My man, you know that this is a vast kingdom, but thanks to the caliber of engineering science, we know the exact area of land down to the last square foot. Your job, cover the land with leather and sew it tight. Oh, Bena, what? No can do. You are commanded to perform the task for His Royal Highness. But he has dusty feet. Uh, my dear fellow, I, I, I don't think you know what you're saying. Nobody in this land can refuse an order given by, by the king. Where will you find so much leather 
how many cow and buffalo and sheep you will kill to make skin to cover the land that is not our concern that's what you must find out you also have to find a way to get all that leather uh, and it is your job uh, to sew it all tight and keep the the dust trapped underneath by now the cobbler has pulled out two large pieces of leather and two lengths of string it may be simpler to cover the royal feet with leather to prevent the dust from getting to them he ties up the makeshift footwear and asks the king to try them you may take a few steps now your majesty to see how they fit <laughs> uh, what do you call this, this thing on my feet? A feet of float, a of skin of goat, a leg boat. Shoe. Uh, yes, my good man. What do you call this marvelous covering on my feet? The cobbler offers a suggestion. Why not shoe? Shoe. Shoo! A shoo! Shoo, shoo, shoo! <laughs> I suppose the English will come along one day and teach us how to spell shoe? <laughs> 